You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life changing, life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Joshua chapter 5 um, is where I want to hang out today. And while you're turning to Joshua chapter 5, let me remind you of how we got here. And this is a series that we're calling the success series where we're walking through gleaning from these 24 chapters in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, uh, Moses dies. A new leader surfaces by the name of Joshua. He takes on command of Israel. Joshua chapter 2, Joshua commissions two spies to go check out the land, especially Jericho. I think it's two spies because when he was sent out amongst the other spies, when Moses sent him out and the 12 spies, only two of them came back with a good report. And that was Joshua and Caleb. And I thought Joshua was like, you know what? I'm not taking my chances with any more than two. So he sends out two spies and uh, they need to get rescued and protected at the home of the area brothel, the area prostitute house. And God uses this woman remarkably by the name of Rahab. In Joshua chapter three, they now begin to cross over the Jordan. They cross over the Jordan in chapter three and across Jordan into Canaan, the promised land. In chapter four, God says, set up some memorial stones to be reminded about what I've done in your life. Now, this is what's important. Chapter five, God halts all the action. They, 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 I mean, it's one moment after another, so much to the point that when we started talking about this last week, we talked about the fact that you can get so caught up in the action of Joshua that we miss the spirituality of it. We miss the spiritual messages. Nothing but action. And then suddenly, chapter five, verse one, all the action stops. And there's a reason the action stops, and that's what I want to teach about. I want to teach about what it looks like for us to have total commitment. And, and maybe I shouldn't be telling my business like this, but I have learned in my own life, any area in my life I've had total commitment, where I've been sold out, I've been all the way in. I've not remotely been in between anywhere. Any area in my life I've ever been totally committed, I've had total success. And any area that I've not been totally committed, I've not been as successful. And so I want to talk about the value of this and three main aspects of this total commitment. So if you go with me to Joshua chapter 5, I want to begin reading into our hearing at verse number 1. Joshua chapter 5 verse 1 really serves as a bridge verse. It serves as a bridge verse bridging the end of chapter 4 to the new activity now in chapter 5. Now remember, chapter 4 even... Chapter 4, at the very end, um, we're told in verse number 17, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 4, at the end, uh, beginning at verse number 24, God says, I'm doing all this so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Now, here's the bridge verse. God says, I'm doing all this because I want folk knowing I've got power. Immediately, we have evidence that what God asked for happens because the bridge verse, chapter five, verse one, as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Now, this is very important. These are enemies. These are not people that are friendly to the cause of the children of Israel now coming into their territory. Let me tell you why this matters. Because Joshua being a good commander, he would be like, man, you know what? This is the time to attack. We have rhythm. We have momentum. We have confidence and evidence, confirmation about what God is able to do. This is the time. We need to pounce them. We need to get them. God stops all the action. And he does something that's mind-boggling. He says, chapter, 
chapter five, verse two. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. All the men are like, mm. You know, as a man, there's some scriptures just hard to read. <laughs> just, it just, you kind of read and wincing at the same time. So, so Joshua made flint knives. Now, it almost sounds like they're being circumcised the same man a second time. That's not really what's being communicated at all. So let's look at what it says. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath, Haraloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. Let me stop right there. So this is mind boggling. God is like, don't worry about the kings and the other people you got to fight. You got them. You're going to beat them. I've already told you that. The issue is I can't have you going into the promised land, not having kept the covenant I told you to keep. So the issue is not your enemies. The issue is, are you as committed to me as you need to be? And that's what I want to talk about, this total commitment that we've got to make. So let me say a couple things by way of introduction. First thing that I want is just, just to kind of get this all set up by way of introduction is that, number one, I want us to make this declaration. I want nothing less than God's best for my life. Y'all, I want you to rehearse that thing in your spirit. Let's say it together one more time. I want nothing less than God's best for my life. This is what he's communicating at the onset. Who you have become is not the best. I want your best. We're going through this as a church right now, that what God is doing in our lives is going to require the best version of us. Most people fail because what they give is not their best version. College students that should have 3.8s have 2.8s, not because they're not 3.8 worthy, but because they don't give their best self. People wind up making commitments and vows and they're not honoring them and getting divorced because the couple did not both give their best version of themselves. When we give our best version of ourselves, something radically begins to happen. And this is that total commitment that he's talking about. We should want nothing less than absolutely God's best for us. We're going to see that play out in chapter five. The, su the second point to our introduction is that every call to success has a requirement. Every call to success requires two things. And let me tell you the two things that every call to success requires. Tell the person next to you, God wants you to be successful. You... But it's going to require something of us. Two things. First thing that we're going to see that it requires is it requires the cost of service. God does not want us successful and it all be about us. There is a cost of success that says God is driving me to be of service to other people. It's always a cost to success relative to my cost of service to other people. But this is the real teaching point of Joshua chapter 5. It's also a crisis of surrender. I can't be successful until I properly navigate this season of this crisis of surrender. I've got to surrender myself. And I'm, I'm, I'm emotional today because it's our church birthday, you know, in a couple of days. And so I've been thinking through the journey and thinking through the process. But one of the things that I can absolutely say without any fear of contradiction at all is that one of the reasons we've been successful is because there's been a group of people that have made up in their mind they're going to surrender to what the vision is. And, and, and it's, it's no room for one foot in and one foot out. It's no, it's no warm, I gotta be hot or cold, I gotta be in or out. People, you gotta get in the game in order to be successful. Never want, think about it like this. I love, I love college basketball, I love sports in general, but particularly college basketball. And I, you know, we get all frustrated with these, particularly UNC's win record this year, but that's a whole nother story. But when we, whether it's UNC or Wake Forest or Duke or State, most of us, if we follow those teams, know their win record and loss record. 
Now check this out. Every game has referees. What's the referee's win-loss record? We don't even think about it because all we care about are the folk in the game, playing the game. This is what we got to be all the way in. And so there's this issue of a crisis to surrender. They are going to be confronted with that in just a moment in these first few verses. Now, this might be the best teaching point of the morning or the afternoon. Understand what chapter five represents. Chapter five is preparation for chapter six. What happens in chapter six? The walls of Jericho come down. But God says in order, see, the issue is not the kings I'm going to give you dominion over. I got to get you totally committed to do the bigger work. Now, let me tell you what, why this is the best teaching point of our afternoon. Because the walls are going to come down in chapter six. But walls fall only after wills fall. So if the wall, if the will doesn't fall in chapter five, the wall doesn't fall in chapter six. Teach Pastor Gary. And y'all, this is the big struggle for us. We want walls coming down, but we don't want our wills coming down. And so God is like, this is what you're going to do. You're going to halt the action. I've given you victory, yes. The, the kings are shaking over what I've done. But let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm a weak in every warrior. You take all the men that's going to fight and I want you to circumcise them. Halt the action until your will gets right because I got walls for you to conquer in the future. This issue is so pivotal for us because whether we talk about our churches, our community work, our not-for-profit work, our relationships, our schooling, our business enterprises, you name it. The condition of my will is intimately tied to my ability to conquer walls. And all of us have walls to conquer. You know, when it's finals time, that's a wall. But unless my will surrenders and I don't go to the party, when there's a problem in the relationship, walls. But unless my will surrenders and says, I made a vow. Yeah. Every area of our life, there is a linkage between my will today and my future wall tomorrow. And this is why chapter five is so pivotal. This begins to be the bridge between the great work that's gonna happen in chapter six. So what I wanna do, is I want to give you these three major aspects of total commitment. And here's the first major aspect of total commitment. Number one, it has to begin with renewing our devotion to God. Amen. Renewing our devotion of God. Now, I've read this. I want to look at this again. But let me tell you what this is really, and put this in your margin if you're taking notes. Verses 1 through 9 is not only a renewing of, our, of their devotion to God. Let me tell you what else it is. And I don't want to be too deep with this, but it's a repudiation of their old life. It is their disavowing their old life. It is them distancing themselves from what they used to be. It is their rejection of what they used to be. Because I'm going to take you way back to how they should have already been circumcised. And God is like, I got to take you back to what you have disavowed. And you need to recommit yourself to me and it before I move you forward. So let me say a couple things about this. Let me say a few things about this. And I, and I know we've read it once, but I just want us to get it in our spirit. And so as soon as king, so chapter five, verse one is basically the kings. I mean, literally, they are they are just depressed over what God is doing. Chapter five, verse two, the Lord then speaks to Joshua, make some knives, circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. You know, what this reminds me of. I don't know how many of you had this experience, but when we were growing up, we used to have to go get what we were about to get whooped with. I don't know how many of y'all had that experience. Just, you know, and if you had a, if you had a smart attitude about it, you know, because mom would like, go get me a switch. 
we come back with a twig. <laughs> and then she ready to chop the tree down and hit you with it. it. So I'm thinking about these guys, like I gotta make my own knife. Like I'm thinking about this struggle. Can you imagine what's going on in their mind? Man, you gotta make the knife you're about to get cut with. Now it's a reason for that. And this is letter A to the point. The reason for that is that God is going to test the will and obedience of the people. There's always going to be moments where God is going to test whether or not you are committed. Why do you think folk get on your nerves at church? Have you ever realized that church folk get on your, work, work, your nerves worse than everybody else? But God needs to test your commitment. If folk can work your nerves and you leave, you're not committed. You know, so, so he's going to do something to test my will and my obedience. Are you willing to do what I want you to do? Because understand, we have crossed over now. And I could say, you know what, I'm just going to take my chances and fight. I'm just going to fight right now. God says, nope, stop the action. I want to see if you're in with me. If you are totally committed to me. So watch what he does. Let me read a little bit more. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel. And that this is the reason. So because none of them, all the male, none of them on the way of the wilderness. And I got to think of it. Can I just spiritualize this for just a moment? How many of us have continued on the journey out of covenant? They're born in the wilderness. That's part of the journey but they were not circumcised, which was the first covenant requirement. And I think a whole lot of us want to be on the team, but we don't want to sacrifice anything. We, we want to be on the journey, but we don't really want to do the stuff that's needed that God said do to be successful. And God says, you know what? I'm stopping the action. Can I just, can let me church talk this? Let me stop. No, you're not singing no more. You're not greeting no more. You're not going to work in the nursery no more. You're not doing, you're not going to be a youth investor no more. Stop the action until you honor the requirements of my relationship with you. Can you, can you imagine what, we, we hardly have anybody left. If God said, pump the brakes, stop the action. You don't tithe, you don't come to Bible study. All these folk that's not honoring the covenant, you can't participate anymore. Until you begin honoring the covenant. So let me say a second thing about this letter B. God then will require that we break the cycles of past disobedience. Some of you feeling a little funky about what I'm saying, particularly about tithing. So let me release you. <laughs> what he's communicating is you got over and I kept you on the team. Now that you clearly hear what's right, do what's right. That's what he's communicating, whether it's Bible study, time, whether it's serving in ministry, whatever God requires of us. At some point, we can break cycles of past disobedience. We we don't realize this, but part of leadership now it's going to get tight. Part of leadership is circumcision. See, we are so caught up in having big numbers that we are not lovingly willing to take the knife to people. Ooh. So when somebody tells you about yourself, they're taking a knife to you. Not to kill you, but to make you better. So literally Joshua himself circumcises the leadership, circumcises the people. Because we have to be willing. Because remember, God is not ultimately interested in the foreskin of male genitals. That is not what, sir, it is an object lesson symbolically about what happens internally when we circumcise our heart and cut off the things that dishonor God. That's the point of it. And so think about this, the homework for today. Think about this for a moment. What is it that I've historically been disobedient about that beginning today I can do something about? Because let me tell you something, if I don't do it in chapter five, 
I'm not going to be able to take the wall down in chapter six. But let me say another thing about this. The thing about this that I want us to grab a hold of is that God will require we break the cycle of past disobedience, but it means I have to move beyond forgiveness to repentance. (laughs) See, forgiveness is simply dealing with the result of my sin. Repentance deals with the root of my sin. Can we be really honest? Most of us, half of us, I'm going to say, I'm going to give half of y'all a break. Half of us only want to be forgiven because we've been found out. And if you don't believe me, the proof of the matter is, the proof of the matter is we wind up oftentimes asking for forgiveness over the same thing again. What God was saying is, it's not enough to say, forgive me while I was in the wilderness and we did not circumcise our children. God, this can go, this can go in a whole nother direction now, Kyle. Because how many grown men are experiencing unnecessary pain because of what we didn't do with them while they were a child? Because had the parents... I don't have help. That's all right. Had the parents honored the covenant when the child was eight days old, because that was the covenant. He would not be enduring the pain and the discomfort as a grown person. And there's a requirement upon us as parents that we don't subject our children to our own disobedience and then create greater pain for them in the future. And so it requires not just enough to say, God, forgive us for what didn't happen in the wilderness. God is saying, no, real repentance is you're going to cut it. You're going to correct it. You're not going to keep running to me talking about forgive me. If you if you want me to forgive you, get change it, fix it. So I've got to move beyond forgiveness to repentance, it's cutting away. Now let me, let me keep going, let me keep going because I want us to get the value of this. This issue of circumcision is, is cutting away whatever our flesh tends to exalt above God. Homework, homework. If I've got attitudes, disposition, people, anything, my job, my money, my profession, my ministry, my popularity, if any of it has been exalted higher than God, it needs to go. And we've got to have the willingness and the ability to take the knife to things that are higher than God is. This is what he's communicating about this issue of finally getting to real repentance and not just forgiveness. Let me say another thing about this. The other thing about this is There will be no circumcision without pain or wounds. Oh, boy. Now, I want to park here for just a moment. We would be amazed what can happen in our lives if we are willing to endure some pain to allow us to overcome the things we didn't get right in our past. I think too often times as believers, we want a no pain, no discomfort Christianity. We want this Christianity where like it's all easy and good. And sometimes, let me tell you something. We hold on sometimes to people and attitudes and dispositions simply because we don't want to go through the pain of living without them. And at some point, And you need to get this. We all need to get this in our spirit. I'm learning in my own life. The pain of staying like I am is far greater than the pain of me doing something to change. I want to encourage somebody about this. You are already dealing with the greater pain. You think it's going to hurt worse to change? Let me tell you something. You're going to be surprised how much better your life is because you are willing to cut some things and some people off as opposed to just keep living less than. So here's the issue then. This is still about this, making sure I'm clear about my commitment to God. Here's the issue. 
Letter E, I have to risk trusting God to the point of my own vulnerability. Get the image of what's going on. I know, men, you're having a hard time keeping up with me. I get it. I get it. But here's the image of what's going on. The very men that have victory in their own strength, so they think, God now causes them to become circumcised where they only can trust God with their own vulnerability. Most of us don't trust him. Deep down inside, let me tell you what we do. We trust our intellect. We trust our influence. We trust our answers. We trust our strength. We trust our spirituality. We trust our prayer life. Let me tell you something. Many of us have more faith in a prayer than we do God. Y'all catch that next week. We, God doesn't move because you pray. God moves because he's God and has power. So I don't have to, we, we, we have this attitude of like, if I can just pray it the right way. You can pray the perfect prayer. It could be theologically sound. It could be honoring to the Lord and nothing happened. And you could stumble over your words, barely able to get them out all right. And the Holy Ghost is like, I got you. I heard you. I'll take it from here. And when I don't know how to utter with my natural mouth, the Holy Ghost makes intercession for me and takes it back to God with interpretation. Can I park here just for a moment, just to remind you of the power of that when you stumbling over all that stuff, literally the Holy Ghost is an interpreter. And he's going back to God, the father, like what he meant God was. Who he meant to mention God was. What his real struggle God was. So I can't have faith in my, my prayer. I got to have faith in God. And oftentimes, until we risk vulnerability, this is a free word for anybody that ministers before people. Whether you're in a classroom, a pulpit, a women's group, a small group, a church of study, a Sunday school, please hear what I'm about to communicate to you. God is always speaking to us. The Holy Spirit is always giving us knowledge and wisdom. Most of us don't trust God enough to be obedient to what he said because it's going to appear to make me vulnerable. And I can become so caught up, I can be some co caught up in protecting my reputation that I miss what God told me to do. Sometimes your best moment is when you're risking vulnerability. And y'all, we have to recognize, man, when God does great stuff in our lives, it's not because of our strength. And it's not because of our power. It's my willingness to risk embarrassment, my willingness to risk looking stupid, my, embarrass my willingness to risk people thinking I'm not on point. When you risk it like that, then God shows up and does great things. So this is the other thing, though, that circumcision reminds us of, this first big point of total commitment. And that is God desires to remove our past shame. Amen, God. Thank you for this. This is all under the issue of renewing my devotion to God. The, the, these men who have not been circumcised, there is a shame attached to their past. And now, even though they're much older, God is interested in removing their shame before they fight their next battle and fully occupy the promised land. I want to say this with all the love that's in me to say. When we are believers in Jesus Christ, when we are firm in our faith, then we serve a God who literally takes away the shame of everything I've done in my past. I think too often times we allow people to make us into who we used to be and to define us by what we used to be and what we used to do. And you got to feel good about who you are in Jesus, knowing that I'm not the mistake that I used to make. I'm not that person. I'm not in that lifestyle anymore. So God is interested in renewing this covenant with them and them renewing their commitment to him as evidence in this physical circumcision that is really much more about getting them to a good place spiritually. Now, this might be the second best point of the afternoon, at least for me. You can tell me later. And I'm going to show it to you before I give it to you on the slide. Chapter 5, 
So let me pick up. Let's say let's pick up now at verse five, chapter five, verse five. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. And so all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua was circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And this is where we're going. Verse 8. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Oh, this is so good right here. We must be willing to submit to a healing process. When we try to move forward, when we're still hurting, we wind up damaging the people on the journey with us. And sometimes we just have to quietly sit and be healed. Come on, say amen if you know I'm talking. When, when, when you've been hurt by a church, you come to another church, that's not the immediate moment. You just jump right in. You take a moment to get healed. This is the problem with... This is the problem with rebound relationships. You've been hurt by one person. You want to jump into the next one. No, you need to take a moment. Everybody say to be healed. So God does not allow them to move forward until they arrive at a place of healing. Because the first big part of commitment is renewing my real commitment to God, renewing it. Here's the second big point. The second big point is I have to remember the goodness of God. Now, look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, it says, while the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, and I I told you a couple weeks ago, Gilgal means you're beyond reproach now, above reproach. The things that used to get you are not getting you anymore. When the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening of the plains of Jericho. On that day, after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, because, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, I, I love this. Y'all, they have not had Passover for 39 years. This is something that now they've got to begin renewing again. Let me just remind you, look look at one more time, look at it one more time. Um, Verse 10, the people of Israel encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month. Go, Go keep your ribbon in there real fast. Look at Exodus with me real quick. Let me just give you the proof, the proof of this. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 is about the Passover. And they get this instruction about keeping the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, let me just, I got to read it quick, but look at verse number six, chapter 12, verse six. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then you will take some of the blood. He talks about what to do with the blood. And, And this is what he said. Look at verse 14 of chapter 12. This day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. But they haven't been able to do that for 39 years. Before they go into the promised land, they immediately keep making past mistakes right. And I think too often times. Man, God gets us to a good place and then we act like we didn't have a raggedy past and then we have no commitment and no conviction to reaching back into my past and making it right. And so let me say a few things about this because because this Passover is a way of remembering God's goodness in their life. And let me say a few things about it, letter A. 
And I got really convicted when I was writing this because we have to, part of this is honoring the traditions of our past. And I know tradition for the sake of tradition is not necessarily always a good thing. But I think one of the mistakes, and this is so good, I hope everybody can embrace this. It is important. Now, you, you missed what I taught, so let me do a better job of teaching it better. The previous generation had died. This generation had all been born in the wilderness. Since they've been in the wilderness, they've never one time had Passover. But with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, none of that generation was alive to even teach them to pass over. But this new generation would not dare walk into the promised land without reaching back and honoring what their parents and foreparents had done for them. And this is a this is a murky place for us in modern day life. Because we have a younger generation that wants to totally ignore the traditions of the past. That's dangerous. And so part of it is remembering God's goodness. You know, I mean, I could overly simplify this. It could be just as simple as the next generation knowing grandmama's potato salad recipe. I mean, how many how many new generations have Thanksgiving meal now? It don't taste nothing like. When mama was cooking, don't taste nothing like grandma. And the reason is because you're trying to live in Canaan without honoring the traditions of your past. Now, don't worry, young people. I'm going to come get y'all, too. I got something for y'all, too. So they begin remembering the goodness of God. And they immediately then partake of the Passover meal. First time, 39 years, 40 years. But here's the second point to this. The second point to this is... There is inevitable loss in all of our gains. <laughs> Y'all, because the moment they get something new where they can now eat off the lamb, the manna stops. It, can, I just, can I just minister this just for a moment? See, I think we have not enough people enjoying the better of the land because it requires their labor. So they would rather have manna that doesn't require anything of them. And y'all, we need to kill that demon. That it's not just good enough for me to accept what's going to come to me freely. God now wants to grow me to a point where I can get better, but it's got to be at the fruit. It's got to be the fruit he gives, but the labor of my own hands. But in order to get that, it's going to require some loss. I'm going to lose the manna to get this. And this is the case of success, that God will elevate us to places that will require, as he does a new thing, it's going to require that he no longer does the old thing. While he introduces new people to work with me, it may require old people are no longer around. And most of us never free ourselves up for another work because we don't want to experience the inevitability of loss. It's inevitable, particularly if we're going to be successful. So let me say it another way. Let us see. Eventually, the miraculous will cease. Whew. We live in a church culture and we live in a culture around success in general where we are excited over the miraculous. We're excited over, you know, just all of the energy and all of the movement and all of the spirituality. And at some point, God is like, I'm not going to keep giving you manna. I'm not going to keep doing the miraculous. You're going to have to be content with us just having a daily ongoing relationship with each other. It, it's, it's almost like, a husband and wife only can be happy when you're on vacation. Every weekend is not vacation. But if we can just enjoy being together, this is what I'm trying to get you to see. If my relationship is miraculous dependent, then I'm missing the whole point of the relationship. Because when we get to a certain place with God, it's not going to require all that, God. I'm just grateful that we're here together. 
So we got to be very careful because we have moments. I want you to receive this. This is the pressure of a person like me who teaches. You know, every week you come out here, pastors come out to preach, Sunday school teachers preach, people talk about or to teach how good the lessons was, how good this was, how good this program was. And if we're not careful, we get caught up in feeling like we need to be really something major in order for people to be good. Can I tell you the best part of Bible study? It's going to get a little bit convicting, but hey. The best part of every Bible study is the reading of the text. Y'all didn't catch that. The best part of every Bible study is when somebody stands up and reads the scripture. Because that's the only part of the Bible study that don't have no man in it at all. Because everything I'm teaching, as much as I believe it is accurate and God is honored, it's got some James Galliard in it. But when you stand up and read the scripture, that's all God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And I don't need a bunch of extra. You can just give me that and I'm in a good spot. Hold on to this sheet. Let me give you this last point. I'll finish this up next week. Um, where are we at? Letter D. That's the last one. So, young people, I promise you I was going to end with something for you. Chartering new territory is a combination of celebrating the old and consuming the new. Because they have the ability to experience both manna and the new thing God is doing. And as believers, y'all, in order to be successful, I've got to have a sense of appreciation for what God used to do. And then I've got to be open to the new thing God wants to do. It is not either or, it is both and. And so every church should be filled with people. This is understanding that if I'm serious about what I want to do and be successful, I need to glean from the people that have gone before me. And then I've got to be excited about the new thing God is going to do with a new generation. Everybody say total commitment. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.